has she been uh, working here? No. 35, 36. Always with you? No. Actually, she's with me maybe 20 years. Okay. But my others, I had only two secretaries in 70 years. Wow. My, my other one retired at age 80. <laughs> wow. And then she, uh, and I only come in the one day, right. so she comes in two days a week now. And she, she likes that. She keeps busy. You know, busy and, and ready to go whenever you are. Okay. Okay. So again, so thank you. And I'll just um, ask you questions and, you know, just respond however. And if you don't want to respond, like I said, you can, you can say pass. Um, but just to start, um, it's Wednesday, October 30th, 2013. And can you please um, give your name and then spell your name? Okay. It's Paul Hyman. H E I M A N. And can you tell us where and when you were born? Yes, I was born in September 7th, 1926, in Munich, Germany. And were you born Paul Hyman or were, did you have a different given name? No, I was born Paul Hyman. I had two ends. When did the ends come up? When we came to America. They said, shorten your name. And my dad said, well, you can only shorten by one end. <laughs> um, what do you remember about your childhood growing up in Munich? Well, we lived uh, in Munich right where the Hitler had his training grounds. It was called the Theresian Wiese. Wiese is park. And uh, I walked to school. It was only two blocks to school. And uh, there were four Jewish kids that were still going to that school. And we all met at our house and walked together. And. Uh, well, in 19, that was 1932, it was good. We had snow on the ground six months of the year at that time. And then when Hitler came in 33, we didn't realize anything different till about 1935, probably 1936. All of a sudden, our non-Jewish friends were told from one day to the next, if you talk to Jewish children, you're considered Jewish. So do not anymore communicate or play or do anything with Jewish kids. Again, you know, being uh, at that age, you don't realize what's happening. And at that time, still, the teachers paddled the children either on the hand or on the behind. And for some reason, from that day on, they always picked on the Jewish kids and paddled them. And uh, I went home to my dad and I said, something is wrong, dad. And he said, oh, it's just temporary. Don't worry about it. My dad was sure that Hitler will be gone and uh, the German people will not let this happen. My mother was more concerned and she really tried to tell my dad, maybe we should think about going away, leaving Germany. Well, my dad had a real good business and uh, till 35, 36, he did okay. And then they put signs in the door, do not patronize Jewish businesses. And that kind of affected him quite a bit because he had a lot of, most of his customers were not Jewish. And uh, he was advised by a good friend of his who later on saved his life, 
sell your business if you can and move away from that park. Reluctantly, he took his advice and he had a person that always wanted to buy his business, a competitor who uh, bought his business and the building where he was in, figuring I never have to pay for it because he won't be around. And uh, so he changed the name of the business to his name and uh, we moved to the outskirts of Munich and he said move up as high as you can. I mean this man was with the Nazis, either you were with them or you were against them and you didn't have to be, believe in them, but in order to be safe, he was a Nazi and he became finance minister under Hitler. And uh, he met with my dad always at midnight. We kids did not know that. And he knew exactly what the plan was. He couldn't say that directly, but he just warned my dad to leave. Well, he didn't want to leave. And uh, so we moved to a third floor apartment. We probably moved in 1937. And uh, in 1936, Jewish kids could no longer go to public school. And uh, I went to a synagogue where the rabbi taught the Jewish kids that were still living in Munich. Many of them, of my friends, had left. But my dad was convinced that things will change, we don't have to leave. I bicycled from the apartment to the synagogue and had to go through Munich downtown. It was about a 40 minute bicycle ride. And uh, that was really the extent of the school. Now cut a minute. I don't know if you want me to go on the detail of the yeah. 9th of November. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. On the 9th of November, I went to school like every other morning and uh, didn't really look around what was happening. And when I got to the synagogue, there were Nazis all over and they said, lucky Jewish kid, no more school for you and the synagogue was burning. Well, when I saw that, I turned around and uh, went through downtown and saw all the Jewish businesses, the glass broken, stuff stolen out of it, which I didn't notice going, I just didn't pay any attention, and uh, got home, ran up the three flights of steps, and I couldn't catch my breath to tell my dad what has happened, but he already had received phone calls that he should get out of the apartments, that they're arresting all the Jewish men and boys 16 and under. No, excuse me, 16 and over. And uh, I was 12 years old. And I had a sister that was five years older. So I wasn't home more than 15 minutes they rang the bell on the apartment, two Gestapo came in and said, we are arresting Karl Heimann and uh, we are taking all your valuables, your car and your money, so make it easy on us and just hand it over. So handed over the car keys 
took some of the paintings. We didn't have them all put up because we went from a large house to a small apartment. And uh, my dad took some money in one place and another place which had some more money that he didn't hand over, luckily, because all your bank accounts were, what's the right word, they were, you couldn't call, you couldn't take money out anymore and wanted to know where the car was parked, and gave him the car keys and took my dad away. Uh, my sister was home and uh, it was just such chaos. Nobody really knew what was happening and you got continuous calls that my husband was arrested and this one and uh, it's just lucky that we did live on the third floor so they couldn't destroy it. the apartments on the first floor. They broke the windows and they broke the doors and so forth. So. Uh, from that point on, a few days later, my mother got a call from an unknown person telling her that a friend of my dad's will make arrangement and will get him out of Dachau concentration camp. However, she has to get ready to pack up. She could take along whatever was in the apartment, but you could not take any money with you, just 10 marks per person. And uh, everything that you had that you didn't have in your apartment, you couldn't touch. So my mother arranged to get a container to pack up the furniture that she had and this particular person said that when Carl comes home, you'll have to leave within 24 hours. We will provide your passport, train ticket to some other country. So at least my mother thought maybe he will come out. He sent us a postcard, which you have a copy of, saying that, don't worry about me, everything will be okay, and uh, I am in Dachau. That's basically what, the, and it was written in pencil, so that uh, it, it's not too legible anymore. 32 days later, after losing 50 pounds, my dad came. I don't remember what transportation they used, but I remember that he walked to our apartment. And uh, in the meantime, my mother had packed up what she could. And where do, where do you send it? So. We had one cousin in America living in Cincinnati. So she addressed it to New York, attention of that cousin, and uh, had a prepay. And whatever was in that container, you paid a thousand dollar duty, and that money you could take from your bank account. But she figured we'll never see that money anyhow. So uh, she uh, bought actually uh, some camera equipment because I was at that time when I couldn't go to school anymore. My dad arranged before all the 9th of November that I would work with a photographer that could teach me how to develop pictures, how to enlarge pictures, and I could go with him in Munich carrying his equipment and we actually went to some of the Hitler uh, talks, speeches. And he knew I was Jewish but nobody else did and taught me all about 
how to take pictures. And so she bought enlargement equipment and everything, which I bought to Cincinnati. And like us, which was at that time, she thought, well, at least we can take that equipment and maybe sell it and get some money out of it. So that kept me busy at that time. And uh, we left the next day after Dad was released. And he had train tickets to Zurich, Switzerland. The money that he had hidden away, he hid in our luggage. And each person was allowed two, two pieces of luggage. Again, you pay duty on that. That was fine. And uh, we took the train from Munich to Zurich, which I don't remember how long it took, six, eight hours maybe. And hiding the money in our luggage that was checked in a luggage car. And he knew if they would open the luggage, that would be the end of all of us. At the point of leaving Germany and entering Switzerland, they checked everybody. Uh, we were in a compartment, the four of us with four other people. And uh, my dad and mother were extremely nervous. We kids didn't know why, kept looking out. And there come two Gestapo. And dad said, that's the end. And uh, you couldn't lock your luggage. They had the privilege of, not privilege, but they just took it to uh, open any luggage that they wanted to. Those two Gestapo walked into our car, came into our compartment, and took two of the other people out. Mirko. A real miracle. The train started moving, and my dad and mother just, like, your life was saved. When we entered Switzerland, they stopped once more for the Swiss control, and we passed that, got to Zurich, and they said, we'll deliver your luggage by luggage. Uh, they didn't have trucks. They had sleigh and horses. They said, uh-uh, wherever the luggage goes, we go. They couldn't figure out why, but they arranged for a sleigh and horses. It was snow on the ground. And uh, the highest which did a wonderful job all over Europe, arranged for us to stay in a rooming house. And uh, so we sat on top of that sleigh with the luggage, went to the rooming house, and my dad said, okay, children, now I'll explain to you how we have to live, what we have to live on. And uh, he opened the luggage, and took out of each piece of luggage the German marks that he swindled out. And uh, my sister at that time, she was 17, and he said, starting tomorrow morning, because he was still concerned that the Germans were watching, you go to each bank with your passport and exchange a few hundred marks so it wouldn't Notice that he had thousands of, da of marks that he swindled out. And that's what we have to live on. So we lived on, in one room, and uh, my mother, who never cooked till we left Germany, and my sister either, they learned how to cook. And mutton, which is the old... Uh, what does mutton come from? Oh. Lamb. lamb, the old lambs. And that was the cheapest you could buy. And uh, we, Dad made application to 21 different countries for permanent visas. Because the Swiss visa was only good for two weeks. 
what's going to happen after two weeks. So luckily we got a visa for two weeks to France who kept us in an internment camp. Switzerland, you could move around. And France uh, never were good to the Jewish people and still aren't. And I don't like France and I don't intend to go to France. I had to add that because that was pretty bad. So we were there for two weeks and uh, they treated you like prisoners, more or less. And where are we going to go now? So from the original applications, we got permission to go to England for six months, which was fabulous. So we went after the two weeks to England and uh, there we also moved into a rooming house where they served mutton. And so uh, it's a smelly meat. And, uh, we had kept kosher till we left. And uh, Dad said, well, we can't keep kosher while we're in this place. They had uh, quite a few German refugees in that facility. And uh, we were just, uh, we ate a lot of vegetables and salads and uh, that was okay. Nobody was concerned really about the food. We were concerned what we're gonna do now. Now in England, you were a visitor, so you couldn't work. And if you go to school, everybody that went to school, they were private schools. They only had public school for six grades, up to 12 years. So my dad said, well, you've got to learn in order to make a living. And uh, my sister did housework. And uh, we, uh, I went to a private school and my dad couldn't afford to take English lessons. So he went to a public school and asked the principal, and my dad was 50 years old at that time, if he could sit in on the classes, just the English class, because his English, he knew very little. My mother was better in languages and she picked it up easier. He would like to sit in the back of the room. He won't disturb anybody. And he would be in the same class all day long to pick up English. And this was sixth or seventh grade English. And uh, the principal was very kind and he said, well, if you don't mess up the classes and uh, you don't interfere, you can sit in. So he, every day, five days, he went to that school and the kids were very interesting because they wanted to know what's a 50 year old man doing in our class. So during recess, they would surround him and he learned a lot of English by the kids asking him questions. And he told them that he came from Germany and he wants to learn English and uh, just talk English to me. And uh, so at lunch, they would surround him and, and he learned quite a bit of English, at least to communicate. And uh, I went to this private school and uh, the end of the, and we were in England, we got the war broke out and they extended our visa for a total of 18 months, six months at a, at a, at a time. And, uh, my mother, well, I forgot to tell you this. The war broke out. See, England was not at war with Germany at that time, but I was bar mitzvahed on September the 13th, 1939, and uh, we were able to a lot of the people that lived in London moved to the outskirts because of the fear when the war stayed out of the gas bombs and the regular bombs. And they were looking for people to maintain their houses 
because they didn't have automatic heating. You had to heat in the morning, put coals in, and to protect the houses. So they asked us refugees, free of charge, we could move into their houses, but we have to maintain them, heat them, and uh, take care of the plumbing and so forth, which was a great opportunity for us to move out that rooming house to move into that facility. And uh, so that kind of helped us. And the school that I went to was within walking distance of that house. And uh, I really enjoyed the school. I learned English and uh, I, I learned other things that uh, were possibly helpful in the future. And when I finished that school, the principal wrote a report card in writing. They didn't have numbers like we have here. And they said, Paul tries very hard. He will be very good in mechanicals. And uh, if he would know more English, he would have passed, but we can't really pass him because of his lack of English language. And uh, the people that ran the school was Mr. and Mrs. Paul, by coincidence. Very nice and very, uh, they really tried to teach me. When the Blitz started, then we had to live in the basement of that house every night because they attacked London nearly every night. And the day after I was bar mitzvahed, England declared war on Germany. That's what, when the blitz started. And uh, about 12 months after we had come to England, my dad's application for a visa to America miraculously came. And uh, we had uh, notified our cousin that uh, we were coming. And uh, we had to get a physical from the American consulate in London to get the visa to come to America. Well, my mother and my dad and my sister passed the physical. I didn't. And they said that I have a tropical eye disease called trachoma. Coming from Europe, how do you catch a tropical eye disease which affects the eyelids? And I would have to be operated on and uh, it would cost a thousand dollars. Well, we had very limited funds and my dad said, well, can we go to other doctors to find out if he really has that eye disease. And the American consulate said, we will only accept what the surgeon that we recommend, what he tells us. If you come with the others, it doesn't mean anything, but you can do that. So the highest, again, arranged four Jewish eye surgeons. They all agreed I didn't have the disease. They gave us in writing that there's nothing wrong with my eyelids. We go back to the American consulate and show them the four letters. They said, we told you, we don't care what others say. But it's just a money-making deal. You have to see my surgeon that they recommend. So we go and see him. Oh, yes, you have trachoma and we have to operate on your eyelids. Well, what a setback that was, but we had no choice. When can you operate? Oh, we can operate next week, but it'll take three to six months to heal. And the, the visa that my dad and mother and sister had expired in 30 days, and we were running out of money. So my dad stayed till the operation was over and they bandaged my eyes for eight days. And they said, we can't guarantee if he'll have the eyesight after we take the bandages off, but uh, the percentages are very good that he will. The nurse that was assisting him forgot to put Vaseline or something on my eyes. So when they took 
the bandages off, they pulled off all the eyelids. And my sister fainted because of my screaming when they took it off. And she's very tough. And, but my eyes were, they thought, okay. So when it was okay, then my dad and my sister booked on the boat to come to America. And my mother and I stayed in England. And uh, they said that every 30 days I can come back to the American consulate to see if it healed enough, if they can give me the permission to go to America. And we went back into a rooming house, took one room because by that time we didn't want to take care of that house with the bombings. And still, most nights, we, everybody went to the basement and the next morning you wanted to see where the bombs hit. It took my January, the operation was in January. Actually it was in December because my dad arrived in America the last few days of December and uh, went immediately to Cincinnati where my cousin put him up, had, had a room for him. And uh, he was trying to get a job for $10 a week, anything, just to, couldn't get a job. And people don't realize in 1940, in January 1940, no, I got the dates maybe a little bit mixed up, the unemployment in Cincinnati was 22%. And nobody would hire him, 50 year old. So he decided, I'll have to start a business one hey, way or another. I'm going to have to stop, guys. I'm sorry. We're